Okay, well, it's a little bit past the hour. Uh, I'm Dan Rabin. Thank you all for joining us at the Branford Forum today. Um, we have some upcoming programs that I would like to announce. Uh, on March 20th, Bernie Pelletier from PACE will talk about addressing climate change through local initiatives. Um, on April 24th, Kurt Johnson of uh, Save the Sound will talk about healthy sound, resilient communities. Um, and Bob Barnett on May 22nd will talk about deconstructing stone buildings. So I think we have a, a great wrap up for, for the season. Um, a few housekeeping things. We are recording the session, so if you don't want to be seen or heard, please hide or mute yourselves. Um, we will have plenty of time for questions at the end, so you can either type your questions into chat or, um, or raise your hand at the end and you'll be able to ask your questions verbally. So today it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Paul Friedman of the Yale University History Department. Um, he has two specialties. One is medieval European social history with a specialization on Spain. And the other one is the history of American food. So today we're gonna to hear about the second specialization. He's published a bunch of books on the subject. Um, I first heard him speak on NPR when he talked about 10 restaurants that changed America. It was absolutely fascinating. Um, some of his other books are Food, The History of Taste. And just last year, he published a book, Why Food Matters. And today he's gonna to talk about American cuisine and how it got that way. Professor Friedman, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Dan, for that kind introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm glad to be with you today. I'm gonna to talk about uh, what American cuisine is. Uh, this is based on uh, a book that I wrote uh, that was published a few years ago. And um, uh, this, um, yeah, this is the cover of the, the, uh, of the book, but I'm not, you'll be relieved to know, going to kind of run through the whole thing at a breakneck speed. I'm going to try to describe uh, why this seems to be worth, or at least seemed to be worth writing about. And then I'm gonna concentrate a little bit on one aspect of it. And that is, when did the idea start that men and women like different foods and various other aspects of the relationship between uh, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, and wives, and the entire idea that, uh, you know, like that women like salads and that men like steaks and, uh, and uh, things proceeding from that. The question that this is supposed to pose is, is there such a thing as American cuisine? And, and the fact that that is even a question is different from most other cuisines. So if you were to go to an Italian restaurant, you'd have certain expectations. I mean, if they don't have pasta on the menu, you'd be justified in asking, well, what kind of Italian restaurant is this? And similarly, even if they're not completely accurate, we have certain ideas of what, say, an Indian restaurant, a Japanese restaurant and so forth will be. But an American restaurant could be anything. I mean, it could be uh, uh, eclectic, uh, you know, uh, 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 tapas, but also meatloaf, but also um, uh, pasta. It, it could be regional, although that's not as common as it used to be. It could be uh, new American ingredients focused, uh, there are all sorts of possibilities. So one of the characteristics of American food is this kind of variety and hard to graspness. And, and this is spreading throughout the world. So here's a sign in France, which of course, along with Italy, is one of the last holdouts of the 
resistance to Americanization. Notice that Americanization doesn't mean that they're just serving burgers. They've got tacos, burgers, panini. And of course, the joke here is the place is called Tacos and Company. And it says authentic French, ha, ha, ha. So tacos, burger, panini, oh, sushi, uh, these are international dishes. Most of them are not American in their origin, but America was the, you might say, retailer of these dishes. That is, panini didn't come to France from Italy. Panini came to France via the United States. The United States serves as a kind of warehouse or distribution point for global eclecticism. Uh, even 20 years ago, and certainly 40 years ago, people would say they weren't French if they were eating things like that. And so uh, the fact that this has spread all over the world is part of the Americanization of cuisine. But Americanization in this case means not McDonald's, it means um, eclecticism. Well, I mean, many foreigners think there is no such thing as American cuisine. And, and in answer to the question, they'll say it's either fast food or um, uh, it is, uh, you know, Americans eat sort of whatever they want. They have, no, they have no standards, they have no particular loyalties. And an answer to that has always been, yeah, but we have these wonderful regional foods, there's no single American cuisine, gumbo in New Orleans, um, blue corn tortillas in the Southwest, uh, fried clams in, on Cape Cod, lobster rolls in Maine and so forth. And, and that is to some extent accurate, though many of these foods like the lobster rolls or the fried clams or barbecue in North Carolina are not things that people make at home very much. They're actually kind of quirky foods that you can get in um, uh, uh, restaurants and, and establishments that, uh, that make them. So, um, you know, what would Connecticut regional cuisine look like? Well, there was a time when there was a Connecticut kind of clam chowder, uh, when people had certain kinds of things characteristic of New England, but, um, yeah, I mean, for the most part, regional food has faded as the country has become more homogenized and as it has accepted a lot of miscellaneous uh, influences. So, you know, you can get fajitas in Miami Beach, you can get fajitas in Seattle, uh, you can get them all over the place. Even when we have had regional food, we've tended to mix it up. Here's a menu from a place called the New Orleans House. But as you can see on the lower left, it's in Lexington, was in Lexington, Kentucky. This menu's from about maybe 1962. So already, okay, so it's in Kentucky, but it's a New Orleans menu. And it says how to enjoy our clam bake. A clam bake is a New England thing. They don't, they don't have clam bakes either in Lexington, Kentucky or in New Orleans. And it, the, if you open the menu, this clam bake has things like gumbo that are unknown to New England clam bakes. And the point is that um, regionalism has weakened and it's been kind of eclectic for a long time. The one place that I would say has the strongest regional roots and has the best regional cuisine in the United States arguably is Southern Louisiana. So New Orleans Creole food and the so-called Cajun food of the rural surroundings of uh, New Orleans. Uh, but this too is kind of um, uh, uh, contested. So uh, race crosses over with region. This is the first edition or maybe the second edition rather of the Picayune's Creole cookbook. The Picayune uh, uh, was the name of the newspaper. Uh, I think then afterwards, Times Picayune. And this 1905 publication shows the custodian of New Orleans food as a Black woman, admittedly a somewhat stereotypic uh, um, African looking stout woman who is seen as uh, so much the guardian of traditions that the book's preface, uh, uh, which is probably a little too small to read and also, you know, 
uh, I'll summarize it for you. It basically says that the reason that they're publishing this cookbook is that the former slaves are now dying out and that with them will die the traditions of Louisiana Creole cooking and that therefore this book, and it's a very long one with hundreds of recipes, is uh, really a work of historical preservation. So in 1903, the authors of this book and the people responsible for defining what is uh, Louisiana food are perfectly happy to acknowledge the black role in it. But uh, by 1940, this is another edition, later edition of the same cookbook, but the author of the cuisine, and it says so in the preface, is French, right? He's a restaurant chef. He's got a mustache that identifies him for these purposes as French. And actually, in the post-war period, well into the 1960s, the uh, tourist brochures and other publicity about the food of Southern Louisiana kind of excised African-Americans. They would say, oh, it's a combination of uh, Indians, Spanish, French, uh, Germans, you know, the sausage, uh, uh, and uh, only latterly sort of were Blacks readmitted to this, or did they sort of take this back? This is a book from the 1980s. Austin Leslie was the chef at one of the most famous New Orleans restaurants called Chez Hélène. He was um, uh, drowned in Hurricane uh, Katrina and its aftermath. Uh, but so it's Creole, which means New Orleans, Creole soul, which means uh, black. And so this kind of um, uh, interaction of regional and racial characterizes a lot of the history of region. Uh, but what American cuisine really, perhaps the most important influence is what many of us grew up with. And that is, for want of a better term, modern cuisine or industrial food. This is a US information agency uh, poster photograph from 1958. And it was featured at things like trade fairs and US pavilions at uh, other events. Uh, I think this one was for a Zagreb, uh, then Yugoslavia fair. And it shows a typical housewife unpacking her shopping. And this, this had such an impact on people in Europe. Uh, by this time, Western Europe was prosperous enough, but the, the cornucopia of products, and notice, of course, they're almost all wrapped up. This is presented then, this is not, you know, a farm to table ethos, to put it mildly. It's the ethos that we all grew up with, uh, all. Uh, I'm assuming a certain demographic uh, uh, in this audience, but you know, you, if you uh, remember, if you were alive when this photograph was taken, let me put it that way, you will certainly remember packaged goods, standard items, Ritz crackers, Wonder Bread, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, um, uh, and, uh, you know, one can go into more detail, but you get the idea. This is celebratory, this photograph. It is saying, and it's true, that the average person could afford all sorts of food items that they did not spend, uh, uh, you know, a gigantic proportion of their budget. By this time, the figure would have been about 25% of the average household uh, spent 25% uh, of their income on food. In uh, 1900, it had been more like 50%. Uh, today, the average is about 17%. Of course, that average uh, is within a rather unequal world in which a substantial number of people don't have enough money really to get through the month and eat three normal meals. And uh, uh, for many people, even with the current inflation, food is an almost irrelevant part of their um, expenses. So, um, you know, this is the, this is the world of um, industrial products that make claims that they're better than natural products. Uh, first, Wonder Bread helped build strong bodies 10 ways, and, and then they decided on 12 ways. Perhaps it was more uh, euphonous. The third aspect, in addition to region and 
standardization is paradoxically, or only apparently paradoxically, variety. Variety like rice aroni. Um, I, I remember an advertisement, you know, with the clanking cable car bell uh, that it came in, quote, four fabulous flavors, unquote. But it comes in many more now, 20 flavors and different sort of uh, sub brands. The point being that an industrial product, in order to distract attention from its often mediocre quality, comes in many varieties. So the yogurt isn't all that great. I mean, how can it be? It, it, it comes from a factory. Um, it, you know, it's not actually from uh, uh, cows down the street. But the compensation is that you can get it in 45 different flavors. Uh, same with Tropicana orange juice. It comes in, um, you know, Grove Stand, Calcium, uh, uh, Extra Pulp, No Pulp. Uh, all of this is to give you the sense of control uh, and kind of cover up the fact that the basic ingredients are not all that uh, are not all that great. So um, uh, Jello is another product that had a lot of applications. Here's one Jello salad. You know the most common flavor used was lime Jello. So this is this is uh, a way of being creative. You create a product, and then uh, instead of just it being served as a dessert, which was what people sort of thought it was, you suggest other ways of using it. And uh, I. Uh, grew up in New York, but was educated in California. And then my first job and, and my job for many years actually was at Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. And when I came to Nashville in 1979, uh, what they called congealed salads were still a big item on kind of uh, modest restaurant menus. And, you know, here's another creative idea. This is from a little cookbook, like a brochure uh, that Knox Gelatin put out on Better Meals with Gel Cookery. This would be about 1960. Well, you get the idea. The final aspect of this variety and eclecticism is um, uh, what has uh, been called ethnic food. That is the food of foreign people, of foreign immigrants. Uh, this is a menu from an, uh, an Indian restaurant in New York. The most popular foreign cuisines or ethnic cuisines in the United States have been Chinese, Italian, and Mexican. Uh, this is the oldest continuous, continually operating Chinese restaurant in the United States. It's called the Pekin Noodle House. Notice that it features chop suey, which was the dish um, that represented uh, China, and that was wildly popular. My students, by the way, usually have never heard of it. Uh, um, this is in Butte, Montana, this restaurant. And I have not been there, but my cousin who uh, lives not far away said it's terrible. Um, I mean, it's worth trying anyway. This is a famous Edward Hopper painting of uh, two women uh, eating in a Chinese restaurant. This is from the 19th. 30s, uh, there was uh, what was called the chop suey craze in uh, 1896 when an envoy from China was uh, uh, feted at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, it was then just the Waldorf Hotel in New York, and supposedly had his chef prepare this marvelous dish called chop suey. This is apocryphal. I mean, he did visit, but there's, there's no record of his chef making anything in particular. But the craze was such that within four or five years in New York City, there were over a hundred chop suey restaurants that were not in Chinatown. So uh, uh, tremendous was this enthusiasm. It's not authentic, but so what? I mean, neither is General Tso's chicken, which is sort of like the chop suey of the late 20th. Uh, and early 21st century. People know that uh, uh, they don't actually have it in China, but so what? Uh, here, this is from um, 
uh, another Indian restaurant called Punjab. Uh, I love this where it says food from the far east to the right, it says Punjab says, try a king sized martini. Food from France, Punjab says with French foods, have a bottle of Bland Van de Blanc. Uh, you can't see the, the rest of it. Uh, yeah, this kind of deliberate inauthenticity is like, I mean, it's like Mission Chinese food, which was wildly popular a few years ago, had Kung Pao pastrami. Uh, well, obviously they're not pretending that this is just like it is in China, but it's not a joke either. It's one more aspect of what I've said is uh, American eclecticism. So I think the summary of this is until the 1970s, at least, what dominated was a fading regional cuisine, industrial food, and variety. Until 1970, because after that, you start to get a organic food movement, a um, movement identified uh, with Alice Waters and Chez Panisse to emphasize the quality of ingredients the seasonal uh, uh, aspects and the local. So local war, seasonal quality and sustainable begin in the 1970s. And I, I tend to see the 70s as kind of either a turning point or the high point, the high water mark of the industrial food system. On the one hand, you have Chez Panisse and Alice Waters. Uh, on the other hand, um, the 1970s when the microwave uh, becomes a consumer household good. And the 1970s is when McDonald's et al. really get into high gear and become, you know, they stop having those signs saying six billion served. It becomes uncountable. So I want to explore, as I said, just uh, in, the, in, in the short time remaining, a little bit about men and women and uh, food. A lot of this has to do with so many different subjects. For example, the ideal female body image. So this is Lillian Russell, the greatest star of uh, the 1890s. And she, her look was called, I mean, she was the original American beauty and her look was called airy fairy. This is where that expression comes from. But obviously by current standards, she's um, um, uh, hefty, I think uh, uh, is a polite term. Uh, the ideal body image was different beginning with the flapper in the 1920s and then the more athletic profile, uh, women were supposed to be svelte and um, you know, less, less padded. And that has some real effects on what women decide they're going to eat. The passion for light food becomes greater. At the time of Lillian Russell, already there were certain female preferences. Sandwiches are introduced as a female item. Chicken salad is a female item. Um, before the Civil War, there is no evidence of this, except that women like sweet foods. The most long lasting idea is that women are partial to ice cream, candy, and the like. By the 1890s, it's that women like light entrees and um, sweet desserts. And this is uh, a, again, a kind of persistent stereotype. In terms of restaurant dining, um, the late 19th and early 20th century were full of attempts to figure out when and where women were welcome at restaurants. They were always welcome with male escorts at night. So here's a picture from Delmonico's, the fanciest restaurant, or certainly the most famous restaurant in the United States in around 1880. Uh, they were not, however, welcome if they were alone or with other women. This was partly uh, due to the fear of restaurant owners of not being able to separate out um, so-called, um, um, and what is the term? Not virtuous women, uh, basically separate out uh, prostitutes from women who are uh, respectable, right, respectable. Uh, and um, so they would just ban women from lunch or Delmonico's by the 1880s has women in private rooms. And, uh, you know, well into the 1900s, uh, uh, there are these um, uh, fights over 
uh, female admission to certain restaurants. Other restaurants were created to accommodate them. That is, through other restaurants, Schraff's was a chain in uh, um, uh, New York and New England uh, that was very popular with women. If you notice, it, under the Schraff sign, it says restaurant and then men's grill. This is from late in Schraff's career when they're panicked over the identification with women because by the 1970s, most women, certainly young women, wouldn't be caught dead in Schraff's because it was associated with a matronly kind of complaining uh, um, middle-aged shopping kind of uh, coterie. And so the men's grill is an effort to say that it's not what in fact it manifestly was, a restaurant for women. And it was a restaurant for women, not only in creating a kind of safe space, but in offering the sort of food that women were thought to like. Uh, uh, and, and I have this photograph of Schraff's. This is not the restaurant that I went to as a kid with my grandmother, which was on the west side. This was on Madison Avenue, but you get the idea. <clears throat> the one we went to was on about 81st Street and Broadway. And uh, my mother, never went to Schraff's because my mother had a PhD and my mother was uh, a, a serious person. Uh, uh, and she regarded her own mother as a non-serious person because her mother, my grandmother, played canasta, mahjong, um, other card games, uh, did not work, uh, knitted, referred to her friends as the girls, uh, lived in Miami Beach. And um, I mean, you know, uh, you understand. So when we went to Schraff's, I don't remember what I had, but I remember that my grandmother would have cottage cheese and fruit because that's a light entree in circa 1960. And um, then she'd top it off with a banana split or uh, a, a sundae of some sort, you know, this compensation of uh, I'm going to have a light entree and then I'm going to splurge on uh, the dessert. And this remains uh, a female stereotype. But um, outside of the world of restaurants, the world of home, the relation between what advertisers assumed or portrayed in America that was all housewives, because advertisers had trouble selling to women who worked before the 1970s. So this is their ideal, right? The man is happy, he's home from work because he's still dressed up. Uh, she's made muffins. This is from a cookbook put out by a flower company. So it's not just that she is a provider of physical sustenance. She is a provider of delight. So magazines and other media exalted the housewife as the guardian of the family. Um, but also more personally, one of the most popular cookbooks of the 20th century, The Settlement Cookbook, had as its subtitle, The Way to a Man's Heart. The way to a man's heart, the full proverb is through his stomach. And, uh, but that created tensions when it didn't completely work. So this is a Kellogg's Corn Flakes advertisement. And it's not intended as a joke exactly. Um, how could you run out of cornflakes? These advertisements portray men as petulant, childish, and incredibly wayward. Um, uh, there's a kind of mixture of food and sex that um, you have to have been alive then to really remember. Once again, these are things that my students, you know, they, they think I made this up. It's one thing a man never turns down a second helping of rice. Well, this is just, you know, uh, come on. But what about this? Why husbands leave home? This, this is in the league of a writer to Betty Crocker, the General Mills icon who received a lot of mail and they had someone answer her mail. Uh, I mean, people knew that she wasn't real or maybe they didn't. But anyway, they wrote to General Mills uh, asking miscellaneous questions. And one of them from the 1930s, and I'm just choosing this at random. Uh, the writer uh, says that she knows that her husband likes fudge cake, but she doesn't actually like it. So she makes vanilla cake instead. But now a neighbor woman uh, has invited them and she serves fudge cake. So the question is, 
is this woman trying to steal her husband? And to us, I guess the notion that this guy is so um, uh, childish that chocolate cake is gonna cause him to completely just, you know, uproot his life uh, is ludicrous. But presumably this could not have been that ludicrous because some company, uh, in this case, Schraft, by the way, uh, uh, that made frozen packaged food to go, some company paid an advertising agency to come up with this. Here's a brochure from a, a stove company, a range company uh, that my mother had. Um, this is about 1962. Uh, it's the Grand Oven Company, hence cooking in the grand manner. And, and look at this carefully. He's home from work again, uh, dressed up. Uh, she has made dinner. Uh, somewhat improbably, all this stuff is in the oven, uh, standing rib roast, muffins, uh, and some vegetables in a pot. And uh, there's something on the stove, but she's dressed to go out. She's not some frumpy, all work, uh, harried housewife. She is a housewife, but she's a housewife with pearls and a low cut uh, 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 dress. And they're going to have their standing rib roast, and then they're going to go out dancing or something. So this is the, the best of both worlds. So food companies exploit anxieties and contradictions. Uh, they certainly did then about uh, marriage, sex, adult responsibilities in order to sell convenience. But they are selling convenience by pretending that it's not convenience. In other words, uh, the Schrafts ad, she's already been serving like canned or frozen food. It's just that it's not any good. So this is not a recommendation to say, husbands leave home, so you know, go out and kill your own free range chickens and cut them up yourself and you know, make um, some galantine de poulet that will take two days and then your husband will be satisfied. And obviously that's not what it makes money for advertisers use our convenience product, which is again, the best of both worlds, high quality and yet um, uh, uh, your husband will love it. Uh, and then later on your kids will love it. So uh, fussy husbands are supplemented uh, after about 1960, 1970 or so by fussy kids. By the 1970s, you get a slightly more um, humane view of men and women. This is uh, a cookbook by the spy thriller writer, Len Dayton. And in, on the front cover, it shows uh, the guy ladling the pasta and being hugged by the uh, girl. And then on the, oh, this is the front cover. This is the back cover. The front cover shows the reverse. She's ladling the pasta and he's the one who's cuddling her. Now, I mean, of course, gender roles have changed. Families seldom eat together. Individuals have different allergies, aversions, food passions, other changes. Uh, and this will conclude my presentation. Uh, so much has changed because of the pandemic. So much was in flux anyway. You've heard the cliche, I'm sure, but the pandemic merely accelerated certain kinds of changes. For example, uh, delivery and uh, takeout uh, and web-based apps for food are uh, um, an increasing share of the not dining at home business. Not dining at home involves more money than cooking food at home for the first time. This uh, happened in 2016. Uh, it then was in reverse in 2020 with the first phase of the pandemic, but has gone back. What the future of restaurants is like, um, uh, not good for many of them. Uh, those that adapt uh, will be ones that do a lot of delivery or that have what are called ghost kitchens. Right, well, there's actually no sit down restaurant. It's just like a series of kitchens that provide stuff to be picked up or delivered. Um, 
certainly a continuation of Alice Waters. This is a picture of her, uh, of um, local seasonal concern for the sustainability, concern for climate change. Uh, these are contradictory though. If you're getting your food delivered, then not only are you not cooking, are you not in control of your health because you have no idea how much salt was used. You have no idea how much fat was used. Um, you're also creating an unbelievable mess of cardboard and other detritus. This is uh, observable, particularly in Beijing, which sort of instantly became a, um, I don't know, 70% delivery and, and the, the tidal wave of garbage uh, has been uh, a, a, a terrible problem to deal with. So these trends are, uh, are not going in a single direction. Another trend, this is Emeril Lagasse, of course, is food as entertainment. Uh, a key thing to food as entertainment is that for a long time, it was entertainment for women. Cooking shows were for women. The point at which men, kids, and others who were maybe not cooking at all spent time watching cooking shows, um, that's the key moment. Uh, I don't actually understand that. But uh, you know, suffice it to say that there's plenty of market research that, that shows that happens. And the um, entertainment value of food includes not just watching stuff, but you know, collecting recipes, TikTok performances of recipes, other videos of you're trying things out. And um, obviously food is a big uh, topic. Vegan and vegetarian uh, continue to grow. The fact that one of the most high-end restaurants in the US, 11 Madison Park, has a vegan menu uh, for which it charges you know, upwards of $300 per person is astounding, uh, although it got a kind of rebuke from the New York Times restaurant critic Pete Wells uh, six months ago. Uh, nevertheless, vegan, vegetarian, as well as trying to figure out how to make lab-based or plant-based meat uh, acceptable or indistinguishable from animal meat, one of the single biggest contributors to both climate change and deforestation and pollution is, uh, is cattle raising. And then finally, the Me Too movement and things like that. Um, this has a big impact on the entertainment aspect and the restaurant aspect. The, um, the discovery that uh, a, a lot of kitchens are abusive places, the discovery that a lot of those male chefs like Mario Batali, who were adored by the media for their bad boy image, that they're actually bad boys, uh, is right up there with that famous Casablanca scene. I'm shocked, shocked to discover that there's gambling going on in this bar. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is a reckoning and it's going to alter, it has altered, is altering chef's behavior. I have trouble imagining a world in which celebrity chefs are celebrated for being nice guys. Um, it's a little bit like a uh, introverted real estate agent. And there are certain kinds of professions where there are personality types that are not gonna work. It is true that the great exception, I suppose, is Jose Andres, who has done a tremendous amount of good in the world, uh, who's a really nice guy, but that's not what got him his status as a celebrity chef. He was a celebrity chef who then became a, um, you know, a disaster relief hero. How you become a celebrity chef via some means other than being a jerk, uh, I actually don't, uh, uh, or look, jerk is probably a little too strong, of uh, being a, an autocrat, that may be a little uh, better. Uh, I, I don't see that, but we can discuss that and more. I'm basically, uh, um, uh, at my conclusion, and, and, and my conclusion is um, perhaps a little upbeat, that even with the um, traditions of uh, mediocre ingredients, over-advertising, um, trendy fashions that don't last a long time, 
Uh, American food has, to its credit, variety, exuberance, and uh, the reason it spreads around the world in the way that I tried to point out at the outset of the talk is, is that exuberance. And, and that is probably the saving grace of American cuisine and indeed uh, in many respects of American culture generally. Uh, so as uh, Dan promised, we have some time for questions uh, and comments and I'd be, uh, uh, I'd be very glad to, uh, to hear them. Great, thank you so much. Um, anybody who has questions can either uh, raise your hand or type them into the chat. Uh, Ted Petrenko. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was a little confused uh, when you talked about uh, Jello and gel, because when I was younger, I'm not a chef. One of my most successful dishes was a um, blue fish aspic, and I thought it was so delicious. And uh, I hope that uh, I'm inspired to do it again. But my serious question is, I notice in supermarkets, uh, it's almost like, if you know, the drug industry has a copyright on their drugs. And after a while, it becomes, you know, uh, available. But I notice in supermarkets, every chain seems to have its own cereal which is like half price. And what has happened to the uh, uh, people that used to buy the brand names, the loyalty seems to be going. And I'm wondering what this may be leading to in the future. Yeah, um, the bluefish aspic, did you make the aspic yourself or did you use uh, gelatin? In other words, did you use the fish itself to make the aspic? I think I cheated. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Jello got its start as an elegant, easy way to make aspic because aspic is hard to make uh, um, without uh, artificial gelatin. Uh, but it then took on a life of its own. So, ninety-nine point nine percent of the people who made Jello, uh, uh, you know, didn't even realize there is such a thing as aspic uh, by say nineteen fifty. The uh, second question is very interesting. The brand names are aware of this problem and try to make you loyal to them despite the presence of cheaper options. And I think we all have a list of brand names that we still will buy, whatever the options are. So I think that Hellman's mayonnaise is better and I'm willing to pay for it and will not experiment with others. Um, a and P used to have jams that were Mrs. Polliner's, and I considered them even as a child to be inferior to say, you know, the European or English ones. So some of it is just uh, the assumption that, you know, th there may be something that looks like an Oreo, but uh, uh, that's what I'm gonna buy. Uh, and, and that works with various degrees of strength so Campbell's soup does not have that kind of loyalty anymore. And the company has trouble uh, uh, dealing with uh, the fall off of loyalty. Thank you. Bob Barnett, would you like to ask a question? Uh, not so much a question, but uh, several comments. Uh, am, am I audible? Can people hear me? You are. Uh, okay. Um, just some of the things that you mentioned in the talk just brought back memories of my childhood in the 50s. Um, <clears throat> and one of them that you said, people don't uh, eat three meals a day anymore. Well, my mother was insistent on serving and us eating three meals a day. My father would come home from work to get his lunch. So it was a, the family thing It was, um, I, I walked home from school to get to get lunch until I went away to school. Um, but at, at my age now, I still do it. And everybody makes fun of me. That mm -hmm. I, you know, it's like I, I can't exist if I don't have breakfast, lunch and dinner. So I, like I say, this is just a comment. And, and, yeah, uh, no, it's but, but it's uh, it's fascinating. I think our age group were either the last to have that kind of regimen 
or the first to start snacking all day. Hmm. Because that's what the alternative is. And that's what the alternative many people have. It's not that they're eating less or really skipping meals. They're just kind of grazing. So uh, I remember actually when I lived with a family in 1974, five, to do my dissertation work in Spain, these were quite well off people, but I was still kind of baffled that they used the refrigerator just to keep food in to prepare. The refrigerator had nothing that you could just go in there and eat. And so you had to like wait for, uh, for the meal. And, um, uh, you know, I, 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 had, I had trouble getting used to that. So uh, that is one of the most important uh, trends. Uh, 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 Dan, should I uh, do one of two of the chats? Yeah, sure. Take Marion Chertos. Okay. Um, yeah, casual and fast food is a dimension of um, certainly of standardization. Uh, the experience of dining out is one where you try to balance predictability with um, novelty. And of course, from the fast food company's point of view or the casual dining places, which have a bigger menu, uh, uh, they try to keep you interested in their offerings by creating certain kinds of novelties without diminishing the brand for those people who say, you know, they want a Big Mac uh, every day and they don't wanna hear about uh, uh, the other choices. So yes, very much this incorporates the kinds of things about standardization versus variety or really standardization complemented by variety that I was talking about. You, um, I have a question. You talked about um, several different um, sort of cross-pollination uh, events, the Chinese food coming here, the Creole, et cetera. Um, could you say a word about foods that are not accepted? Um, you don't see liverwurst or escargot or pickled eel on a lot of menus here. And you also never find root beer or peanut butter in Europe. So what are, what are the barriers that, that keep food out? Some of them I'd say are just quirky. Uh, uh, I had a friend in France who found maple syrup ridiculous. Uh, and she had a lot of Canadian friends. And I remember, uh, cet horrible sirop d'arable that horrible maple <laughs> syrup. Um, but uh, Americans have certain tastes uh, that we may not be aware of. Americans love sweet food uh, that's not desserts. So American bottled salad dressings have lots of sugar. Uh, So-called French dressing uh, uh, is sweet. Americans love sweet and sour Chinese food. But in China, it actually has a sour taste, whereas in as well as a sweet taste. Well, as in the U.S., it's basically sweet. Uh, barbecue sauce, mm -hmm. yeah, very much so. So there, are, there are certain characteristics. Uh, Americans like uh, sweet, salty, and spicy, preferably at the same time. So hence barbecue sauce. Hence, this is why Howard Johnson's fried clams were so popular. Because uh, that's the uh, uh, also kind of quintessence or in distillation of those of those three tastes. Joe Schiffer, would you like to unmute yourself and uh, yeah. ask a question? Yeah, sure. I had actually two questions. Um, one has to do with the relative size of breakfasts, and uh, strikes me that's an interesting. Uh, variant as you look around world culture, eating cultures. Um, and uh, the other had to do with the time of day that people eat. And uh, again, associating eating, um, uh, my first experience in Italy, eating like at a ridiculously late hour, or so it seemed to me at the time. Um, and how would I ever get to sleep anyway? So um, yeah, just any comments on those yeah. two questions? Yeah, uh, again, my experience in Spain was the, first of all, the breakfast was small and we didn't have lunch until 1.30 or so. And uh, you know, by 1.30, normally I'd have had two meals and basically I'd had like one third of a meal. Um, uh, 
families didn't dine that late. And my family had a three-year-old and a 10-year-old, but nevertheless, not that late meant like, you know, 9.15. So uh, yeah, I, I tend to like to go to bed early too. So I, um, uh, I, I know vividly what you're talking about. These are cultural things that change. Uh, but only uh, uh, with reluctance, as do attitudes coming back to um, uh, uh, Robert Barnett's observation, coming back to, uh, in France still, if you if you had a meal sort of standing up somewhere or at your desk, it's not, it's not lunch. Uh, uh, you skipped lunch. A meal is where you're sitting down and you don't have your phone on or your work in front of you. So that's not obviously an American attitude. So they're very different. Uh, they're very different things. Americans, in a way, like big breakfasts, but generally don't have them because of time. Uh, and that's also assimilated to the snacking all the time. You don't really need a big breakfast if you're going to actually have eight meals during a day. Uh, uh, and that's that's kind of the way we uh, we uh, we live now. Um, uh, Mark just. Distasio asked, have you seen any episodes of History Channel's documentary series, The Food That Built America? And if so, what are your impressions of it? I'm embarrassed to say that I haven't seen that many. I, I kind of was uh, annoyed because uh, I suppose I thought that I'd already described this uh, a, a bit myself, but yes. Um, uh, it's it's an important series because it emphasizes the sort of the basic kinds of things, the basic aspects of diet, but also I believe some of the episodes have uh, foods that are not necessarily uh, so basic. Uh, and I think that the foods that build America include things like peanut butter uh, or peanut butter and jelly sandwiches mm -hmm. uh, or um, fried clams. So staying on the media uh, theme, where do you see Julia Child and Jacques Pepin in American cuisine? I'd see them as chapters in the long and interesting story of the rise and fading of French cuisine as the definition of haute cuisine. So one of the things that Alice Waters and other people involved in the California food movement beginning in the 1970s accomplished was to topple France from its position as the arbiter of haute cuisine internationally. From really 1700 until the 1980s, France defined uh, haute cuisine and um, it has subsequently been supplemented if not replaced by Italy, by Japan, uh, you know, then by Catalonia, um, the new Nordic cuisine, uh, um, Peru and so forth. And you can see this in the history of Chez Panisse, which has a French name and Alice Waters original idea was to create something as authentically French as possible. But by the late 1970s, she had moved into something uh, that was simpler, more Italian and maybe Provence inspired and uh, uh, not particularly authentically. French. So Julia Child represents uh, partly the end of the chapter of making, uh, or the last chapter of the long book of making French cuisine accessible, but she also lived long enough and was popular long enough to uh, create a kind of new ethos of cookbooks. Uh, I, I always sort of resented the movie uh, Julie and Julia because it makes it look as if her cookbooks are hard. Her recipes were long, but that was because they didn't take anything for granted. You know, if you followed the recipes, uh, the dish would turn out. Uh, Jacques Pepin is, um, uh, a, 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 you know, a person who has uh, only a little less media presence than Julia Child has had. Um, he really does span a large number of histories. His book called The Apprentice uh, uh, before that became a, a, a different sort of association. His, his book is fascinating because at the age of 19 or so, he was the chef for the president of the French Republic who uh, 
tended to like rather archaic dishes. So here's a guy who learned how to make aspic for sure uh, without cheating. And um, yet, of course, he's a delightful um, explainer, popularizer in the best way. So I guess I'd, I'd give him sort of a chapter of himself uh, by himself. And then didn't he go to work for Howard Johnson's? He afterwards? did, indeed, indeed. He worked at Le Pavillon with Pierre Freny, and they resigned in protest of their ill treatment by the dictatorial Henri Soule, the owner of Le Pavillon. And they went to work for Howard Johnson. Howard Johnson, the elder Howard Johnson, Howard Deering Johnson, uh, within the limits of his model, wanted as much quality as uh, you, know, you could get out of frozen commissary-based uh, food networks. So for example, butter rather than margarine. Um, uh, as much preparation at the restaurant as possible, rather than just everything being delivered kind of read, ready to eat frozen. And um, Papin actually uh, told me that it was one of the greatest jobs he ever had. Uh, he had regular hours, he had a car, he was well paid, and uh, you know he felt he was making a contribution that rather than at Le Pavillon, to spoiled wealthy people who didn't appreciate the food. He was actually bettering the food, albeit for a mass audience. But the whole point of the mass audience was that millions of people benefited from it. He quit, as did, I think, Pierre Freyney, when the older Howard Deering Johnson died and the son, who had been to business school, started cutting costs, uh, which resulted actually in the ultimate death spiral. Uh, of Howard Johnson's because it was perceived that the food was not as good as it had been. You mentioned Alice Waters a couple of times. Can you say a word about um, when you walk into a supermarket in New England, you have blueberries, strawberries, grapes all year round. And there, it seems like there's um, there are costs to that in that not only the environmental costs, but there's a, a, a loss of specialness of season. You don't have to look forward to apples or to fresh pears. They're available all the time. And what kind of influence does has that had on, on the uh, American relationship to food? Well, I think for one thing, it's not really sustainable is the problem. So the average produce item in a New England supermarket has traveled 2000 miles regardless of time of year. Uh, and that's not all climate related, that's often labor and globalization related. So asparagus, asparagus hasn't come from nearby uh, in 50 years. So first it was from California, then Mexico, now most of it's from Peru. That's not because Peru is a great place for growing asparagus. It's a really cheap place for growing asparagus. Um, uh, so those are some costs. The psychological cost of you know, not having seasons, some of us would put up with if the quality was good. So in fact, um, people always knew this with regard to tomatoes. You could get tomatoes all year round, but, but they didn't taste like anything. And, and this has become true of a lot of fruit. Uh, uh, very hard to get peaches or apricots that are, are taste satisfactory. Uh, but you can get something that looks like a peach or apricot uh, anytime you want. So that's that's another cost. So the costs are sustainability, quality of the taste, and then um, I think what you were alluding to is just the psychology of uh, you know feeling that the seasons uh, uh, make sense. And I think that's very important to us in New England and the Northeast um, because we decided not to move to Arizona. Uh, where people, uh, there was a wonderful play I saw where in, uh, uh, in Massachusetts called Boca, and it's about a retirement group of friends in Boca Raton. And one of them religiously looks at what is the temperature in New York. And his rejoinder is always, those suckers, you know, 35 degrees in New York today, those suckers, you know, it's 81 degrees outside, uh, as if that's, that's the definition of, uh, of bliss. When, and correspondingly, the definition of bliss is being able to have strawberries all year round. Um, 
Carol Wyman said she's interested in your comment about regional foods now being mainly served in restaurants. Why is that, do you think? Because they're too hard to make? Not how we eat today, or, and so a kind of nostalgia, or what? Um, it's a little bit like pizza in New Haven is the same thing. Uh, definitely, this is something people really care about and uh, will discuss, and they have their favorites, uh, and there are a limited number of variations, at least the traditional places, but it's not something that people make at home. Uh, some of it is, you know, it, it, it's too hard. You have to have an oven that most people don't have. Same with barbecue. Mm -hmm. The things that people can make at home suffer from the lack of time or um, uh, waning of interest in them. So who makes New England boiled dinner at home? Well, you know, I'm sure there are some people but who, who spends 12 hours making Boston baked beans? Um, this is perfectly feasible to make at home. There's no, there's no special equipment you need. You just need to put the thing in the oven for, I don't know, eight, 10, 12 hours. <laughs> um, and, and people uh, uh, except hobbyists or real enthusiasts tend not to want to be bothered. You can say this for the 1950s, that although the food wasn't very good, it was homemade. People didn't dine out very much, at least, you know, not below the uh, top five or 10 percent of the, uh, the income spectrum. I have a question. Uh, before the pandemic, we had a lot of farmer markets and uh, they popped up everywhere and uh, people um, became more and more interested in really buying fresh food and uh, cooking healthy. Do you think um, that is also in jeopardy now through the pandemic? I don't think so because I know that the farmer's markets near where I live, and I live actually in New York State, in Pelham, New York, uh, uh, did fine because, um, you know, they were outdoors uh, or, you know, you, you, you could, uh, you weren't cooped up uh, in an indoor environment. For the early pandemic, people had to learn or relearn to cook uh, or depend completely on takeout and delivery. So for a while, there was actually a resurgence in home cooking and a hope that people would discover that it's actually not so hard or that it's very satisfying or that um, what I was alluding to before, if you're so concerned about your health, uh, you know, um, uh, you should cook your own food uh, because you don't really know the, the reason that a lot of restaurant food tastes great, as Anthony Bourdain uh, uh, pointed out long ago, is that uh, they exert no uh, restraint over the use of fat and salt. So um, I, 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 think, I, I think it will equal out. I don't think we're going to go back to a, a whole uh, preponderance of home cooking, but I don't think home cooking is going to be destroyed either. We have, um, we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, Michael asked, can you talk a little more on the effect of TikTok and Instagram on the creation of a global eclectic cuisine? Well, the global eclectic cuisine, there's a, there's a book by um, an edited book called Global Brooklyn. And Global Brooklyn means that you, you know, they have one about Ghana, about Accra, uh, about some coffee house there. And it's got the same look that Williamsburg coffee houses would have, you know, untreated wood and sort of little machines and old advertisements and uh, very cool baristas. And this kind of uh, internationalization is forwarded by social media. And the, the notion that you're cool if you're in this uh, environment. Uh, TikTok is, of course, more performative and integrates food into a kind of performative entertainment. It's not that food is a different kind of world uh, from uh, 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 music or uh, dancing, but that it's uh, sort of part of the, 
the part of the same youth culture or globalized culture. And finally, Ronnie Brown asked, if you were speaking to us five years from now, what would you be telling us about? Nah, yeah, if I really knew, then I could, I could make some money off it. <laughs> uh, I think I would be talking about the pandemic in the past instead of in the present. I certainly hope so. Um, and permanent effects versus uh, uh, impermanent ones. Among the permanent effects, I think is going to be uh, um, labor shortages or labor changes. And that uh, I think will also mean there'll be plenty of high-end restaurants left, but there'll be a kind of big gap between the high-end, uh, let's say uh, $100 per person and the low end. There won't be a whole lot of nice, respectable, but not very expensive restaurants. I think that's the segment that's gonna be squeezed. Having said that, you know, uh, it's like the prediction that uh, four-year colleges without a very large endowment are doomed. Uh, I mean, I first read that 40 years ago and it came up again during the pandemic. But this time for real, these places are, are, are not gonna survive. And uh, while they're not flourishing, the predictions of their demise have not been correct. So maybe it's the same thing with uh, uh, full service, but middle-class restaurants. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great hour and um, we will send the recording around to the Brantford Forum mailing list. And we'd, um, I think everybody on the call will put his hands together and, and give you a standing round of applause. <laughs> well, Professor thank Paul you. Freeman, uh, it was thank been you a so great much. pleasure. Thank it was you. a pleasure for me. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.